Hello, this is New Mexico History in 10 Minutes. I'm state historian Robert Martinez, and I'm coming to you from Albuquerque, New Mexico. September 16th, 1821, New Mexico, along with Mexico, gains independence from Spain. It was a wild ride, centuries long, but finally Mexico becomes its own nation, and New Mexicans become Mexicans, Nuevo Mexicanos. The first form of government Mexico has is an empire. Agustin de Iturbide is the first emperor of Mexico. Mandates are sent nationwide, empire-wide, that there should be celebrations. And so uh, within a year in New Mexico, by 1822, there is a celebration. We have a description of it in the documents at the New Mexico State Record Center and Archives. That's quite fascinating. There's a party, there's mayhem, there's revelry. Um, it's quite a celebration. What makes it even more interesting is that by the time New Mexico celebrated Iturbide's rule, he was already out. Uh, that's how fast things could change in history. Now, Mexico wanted to follow in the footsteps of the United States and, of course, the French Revolution in modernizing the new nation. But still, uh, the first thing uh, Mexico did was install an emperor. Before we get too uh, arrogant about that, uh, we have to remember the United States in 1776 wasn't quite sure what she wanted to be either. We weren't sure if we wanted a king. In fact, George Washington, it was thought, might make a good king. Uh, thankfully, that didn't happen. And we have the amazing uh, government we have now. Not perfect, but still functioning and still going. Well, that's what Mexico wanted. So remember, 1822, there were no cell phones. There was no texting, no emailing. No telephones. It took a long time for information to travel up the Camino Real to become the Chihuahua Trail. Nonetheless, this is what happens in New Mexico. Our, our last uh, Spanish governor, Facundo Melgares, he's the transitional governor uh, out of uh, being a colony of Spain and into uh, New Mexico being a territory of Mexico. Just like the United States had states, the United States had and still has territories like Puerto Rico. Um, we became a territory, a departamento of Mexico. And that will be the situation over the next 25 years or so. We'll see a parade of governors coming and going. The central government in Mexico City will send uh, governors to oversee New Mexico, and typically there will, they will be military men. In between these governors, local New Mexicans will be appointed governors. They'll have names like Bartolome Baca, uh, Chavez, Vigil, and of course, Manuel Armijo. Manuel Armijo perceived himself as the Napoleon of New Mexico. We have a painting of him, and it's quite fantastic. It shows a very stately, honorable New Mexican wearing a Napoleon-style hat, which was the style of the day. We call it a Napoleon hat because Napoleon uh, was notorious, infamous, and famous, but it was the style of the day. And Manuel Armijo, on three occasions, was governor of New Mexico. Um, there was also a Saracino, who also had roots in Chihuahua, Mexico, uh, about oh, two generations before, but he will also be a governor of New Mexico. We'll see when we study this Mexican phase, this period of our Mexicanismo, that the New Mexicans were kind of like placeholders. They would sit in the seat of the governor until a new governor came along. 
And these governors would not rule for long. Um, there were a lot of them, about 17, 17 governors in New Mexico total uh, for about 25 years. That's a lot of turnover. And it's reflective of the instability of the national government in Mexico City. Nonetheless, this was how it was. And New Mexico would send representatives uh, to places like Chihuahua and Mexico City to represent New Mexico. I've had the honor and pr privilege of going to Mexico City and studying our Mexican phase uh, at the National Archives there, the Archivo General de la Nación. And it's quite amazing. New Mexico was completely and totally integrated into the Mexican government. In fact, uh, in the 1820s and 1830s, there was more people in New Mexico than in Texas and California combined. New Mexico was the center of Mexican government in the Northern Territories. So we were completely part of that system. Um, representatives were usually local politicos, let's call them, politicians. They were also uh, well-to-do people. They tended to be uh, well-off, uh, landowners, merchants. Uh, they had trade in places like Chihuahua and Sonora. So they carried a certain amount of clout uh, in the local communities. And typically, though not always, they came from the Rio Abajo area, uh, places like Alburquerque, uh, Bernalillo, um, Pajarito, uh, Belen, this area, this part of New Mexico. But what's interesting is it's during this period that we see a heavy politicization of the Catholic Church because there were also Roman Catholic priests who were representatives to the Mexican government and were involved in uh, the doings of Mexican government and politics in the Northern Territories in places like New Mexico. Uh, names like Father Rada and Father Martinez of Taos. We'll hear more about him later. Economically, we were tied to Northern Mexico because we were Northern Mexico. Uh, we were part of that economic system. And um, even more interesting, um, Mexico wanted more people up here. We were sparsely populated. Under Spain, under uh, the colonial Mexican system, our borders were closed. That means officially there was no immigration in or out. Uh, there was no trade to the east with people like British or French or Americans, at least officially. Of course, there was unofficial illegal trade going on. Nonetheless, New Mexico uh, and Texas and then California uh, became uh, magnets for immigrants from the United States, people from Tennessee and Illinois and Missouri and Virginia started coming into uh, the northern territories of Mexico because Mexico opened her borders to immigrants. It's interesting to look at the records because people like Governor Manuel Armijo started to write reports showing concern that there were a lot of Americans coming in and establishing trade and they were um, hunting uh, for animal skins and they were starting to uh, become a, a big part of the local population. So much so in places like Texas, Texas, and Nuevo Mexico, that the Mexican government uh, in the mid to late 1820s actually shut the border between the United States and Mexico to curb that influx of Americans into Mexico. Well, ironically, Americans kept coming. They kept coming into Mexico illegally because that's what immigrants do. It happens. Again, if you want to know what people are doing, uh, study the laws that say, don't do that. Don't come into the country anymore. Well, that's because people kept coming in. They kept coming in legally and illegally. 
And when uh, people started coming here with names like Carson and Bent, uh, there were certain rules they had to follow. They had to become Catholic. Uh, they had to uh, swear loyalty to the Mexican nation and renounce their citizenship uh, in the United States. Um, you'll see, uh, if you study the records that in the 1820s, 1830s, 1840s, you see a lot of American names uh, marrying local Mexican women with names like Jaramillo, Chavez, Romero, Ortiz. The families start intermarrying and interacting. And just like when the Spanish came in the 1500s, 1600s, and 1700s, and cultures and people started to mix, so too with the Americans. They started to come and mix their culture and their bloodlines with the local New Mexican population. So this is uh, the beginning of something else that will happen around 25 years later. But for now, uh, New Mexico is Mexican. We are Mexican. And um, it will go on and on into the mid to late 1800s and also clash, not only with representatives from Mexico City, but also with Los Americanos, the Americans. See you later. Hasta pronto.